right hello everyone salam adab namaste and today we are going to hear professor zoya hasan on challenges to india's democracy uh zoya hasan is a well known scholar of politics and civil society movements and as well as of education she is the distinguished professor at the council for social development and at jnu uh, detailed introduction we have invited dr mujibur rahman from jamia millia islamia uh, beyond that i my role ends here so welcome you all and welcome you all and uh, professor dr mujibur rahman please uh somebody good evening uh, and uh, and good morning to to everybody because this is a talk which is in different time zones in different parts of the world uh i uh, i am mujibur rahman and today we have gathered here for a lecture by professor joya hasan uh, who is uh, one of the most accomplished academic and public intellectual of our time and uh, she will be speaking on the topic called challenges of indian democracy uh anyone who is uh, an intellectual or embarks on an academic life generally sets out to achieve at least three things uh one is that uh, the person writes important books that generates debates teaches in some of the prominent universities and institutions mentor students who also publish books of similar standard and further the boundary of knowledge Professor Hasan has been able to accomplish all the three goals in her life which makes her one of immortal in footnotes as most academics generally aspire to she has taught at Jawaharlal Nehru University where she was dean and subsequently also the chairperson of the center for political studies she had held important positions in different bodies including member of national commission for minorities and served in as in visiting has visiting hold the visiting apartments at various places such as national university of singapore university of zurich uh, maison de sciences du homme in paris center for modern oriental studies in berlin and many other places she was elected as the president of contemporary history section of indian history congress in 2019 uh she continues to remain very active and uh, two of her books are expected to be published shortly in the year of 2022 one is titled ideology and organization in politics polarization and growing crisis of the congress party 2009 to 2019 from oxford university press and the other one is the new grammar of democratic assertion mobilizing for equal citizenship in india besides this she has published close to 18 books which she has authored or edited some of our important works include uh, congress after Indi indira policy power political change politics of inclusion caste and minority in affirmative action education to legis legislation negotiating equity and justice in india her uh, there are uh, remarks uh, concluding remarks on a talk will be delivered by professor amrita basu who is a very distinguished academic teaches at amherst college is Dominic J Pino professor of political science uh, one of her book which is my favorite is called violent conjectures in democratic india published by cambridge university press besides she has number of other books published some of the finest and most well known academic publishing houses university publishing houses from england and us the two of her particular <laughs> essays that i would like recommend all of you to read one is called the long march from ajodhya to godra civil society in the state in service of hindutva published in an edited volume by windy doniger and martin usbam pluralism and democracy in india debating the hindu right and the other one is called prose after gujarat violence secularism and democracy in india edited by professor hasan musirul hasan will secular india survive published in 2004 professor hasan today is going to talk about Uh, on on the topic called the challenges to indian democracy i'll say a few words about this topic and then i'll uh leave the floor for for the organizers to invite professor hasan uh to begin her lecture 
idea of democracy is invariably is associated with challenges. There is a kind of an organic link between the two. This is particularly true in case of India, but then there are challenges of two kinds. One is the challenges which starts with small c, and then there are challenges which starts with capital C. And I hope Professor Hassan would address both of them, more specifically the challenges that we confront today that starts with capital C. As Ambedkar warned at the time of the formulation of Indian constitution that there is a contradiction in India is between political equality and economic inequality and that <coughs> Ambedkar thought could possibly pose great threat to Indian democracy. At this point of time, what is unfolding in India is not exactly what Ambedkar feared those scholars who employ economic determinism would like us to believe. Ever since there is populism in the Western democracy, rise of political leaders like Donald Trump and many others in different parts of the world, scholars have been writing books on democracy and the crisis that democracy is facing. Some of the important works includes works by Oxford philosopher A.C. Grilling called Democracy and Its Crisis, his newest publication is called The Good State on the Principles of Democracy, published a few weeks ago. Likewise, there is a French thinker, Piri Rosenvallon, has written a book called The Good Government, Democracy Beyond Elections, and many others. One of the argument that is generally advanced in the discussion of this kind of challenge that arises out of populism is that they also consider Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi a populist leader and therefore the explanation is that what is unfolding in India is essentially what is unfolding elsewhere. This is almost of a similar kind. This is a formulation with which I have a very, very soft disagreement. I think this is not true. To understand India, one has to look back at least 100 years and figure out what is exactly unfolding into this India has a deep relationship of the kind of politics that was that started 100 years ago. Therefore, looking at India or crisis in democracy as an extension of global politics, you could be misleading. Let me just say a few words and then I conclude. If you look back 100 years ago, you will come across in British India in the political landscape of that time, there were three dominant forces. One was led by Congress and left, which wanted Hindus and Muslims and people of other communities to live together and believed in secular democracy. There was another political force called Muslim League, which wanted a separate country for Muslims. And then there was another political force, which was represented broadly as Hindu right, which wanted a Hindu land. These three forces were united in one objective, which is to kick out Britishes, but they, each of them had a different agenda and different vision once the Britishes depart. By the late 40s, two of these forces were successful. The first and the second, Congress and left were able to put together a secular constitution. And Muslim League was able to carve out a Pakistan, which subsequently is seen as something that was inadequately imagined. In last 70 years, the Hindu right has played the game according to the rules laid by the by its ideological adversary, secularists, and has outsmarted and outmaneuvered them, and has emerged as a hegemonic force today with a clear objective to build a Hindu Rashtra. So therefore, it is important to look at the crossroad in which Indian democracy stands more as, as something that, has, that is dealing with a power struggle. And it is in this context I expect Professor Hassan to share her thoughts and let us know the fault lines and how to deal with the challenges. With these words, I conclude. Thank you. Ji, go ahead, uh, Professor Hassan. It's your Thank turn. You. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me start by uh, thanking uh, the Indian diaspora 
Washington DC Metro, and especially uh, Dr. Razi, uh, Raziuddin uh, for this very kind invitation uh, to give a talk to this very lively and uh, engaging group. And it's indeed a great honor uh, to have been asked to uh, speak again. As he said, uh, I spoke sometime, sometime back more than a year ago. So it's really wonderful uh, to have an opportunity uh, to talk about a larger uh, sort of canvas uh, of issues uh, concerning Indian uh, democracy. Now, uh, the title uh, is Challenges uh, to Indian uh, Democracy. And let me say at the outset that I'm going to be focused on the present. I'm not really uh, going to discuss the history of Indian democracy or the history of the democratic crisis that we have faced from time to time. I am zeroing in on the present. Uh, so this is very much a presentist talk. Now, India is a thriving democracy when it comes to elections and peaceful transition in power, but a diminishing democracy when it comes to political freedoms. The regime loudly proclaims uh, its democratic credentials as the world's largest democracy, owing to the number of people uh, who vote in elections. But there's more to democracy than uh, elections. Cultural nationalism, majoritarian assertion, weakening of constitutional uh, safeguards, hostility uh, towards uh, minorities, concerted attacks on uh, civil liberties, such as freedom of expression, among others, have weakened democracy in India, as indeed uh, in several other countries. The Swedish We Dem Institute at Gothenburg uh, University in its democracy report uh, 2021, just a few months ago, noted democratic backsliding in India, declaring that India now exhibited the hallmarks, uh, not of an electoral democracy, but an electoral autocracy. Now that's of course something that is debatable, but nonetheless that is their, uh, that is their concern and assessment. Uh, just after that, another Swedish uh, think tank, the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, categorized India as the backsliding democracy with the most democratic violations, especially uh, during the pandemic period, and called India a major decliner in its global uh, state of democracy 2021 report. Now, even though Indian democracy has faced serious challenges, most conspicuously during the emergency and from persistent social inequalities, class inequalities, political conflicts, violence, and of course, assassinations and so on, it has shown significant resilience during the seven decades since independence. But today, there is growing concern that something has gone wrong with our democratic project. The decline of democracy has become very real, raising questions regarding India's status as the world's largest uh, democracy. The details of these assessments may vary, but it seems that the politics and policies of the ruling dispensation bears significant responsibility for this downslide. The change has occurred after the rise of Hindu nationalism, described by Christoph Joffolo, who's one of the leading, uh, leading scholars of Hindu nationalism as an ideology based on a sense of vulnerability and prejudice vis-a-vis uh, the so-called threatening others, including Muslims, that the architects of the Hindutva movement stigmatized and emulated. Now, the Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP, and the RSS that embody uh, the ideo this ideology assumed power in 2014 by wielding Hindu nationalism and the polarization it engenders to win an absolute majority. Clearly, the RSS played and continues to play, play a key role in this process of change, playing the same politics of fear that targeted both Muslims and of course, the perennial Pakistan uh, threat. This has shifted 
the political system towards a majoritarian form of democracy, especially after the 2019 general uh, elections, which have accelerated uh, this uh, process. Now, three years since the BJP government was re-elected, has seen the consolidation of the processes begun in 2014, uh, and that is the establishment of a Hindu state. Equally significant is the push towards an authoritarian state with only a token opposition to, uh, uh, to be countenanced either at the electoral or legislative levels. This has had catastrophic effects on the politics of opposition, dealing a knockout blow to the centrist and center-left forces. The key to this dr dramatic shift, and my argument really focuses on this, as Arjun, uh, Arjuna Padaroy argues, is the production of majoritarianism by means of authoritarian rule. These two processes, though separate, uh, currently reinforce each other to abate or, uh, if you will, uh, dilute uh, democratic politics. So authoritarianism is both the means and the end, thus creating a vicious cycle between provocative events and decisions and political outcomes through a blend of majoritarianism and authoritarianism. There are three principal areas of concern. One, the consolidation of a majoritarian uh, brand of politics. Two, the weakening of the checks and balances of constitutional government and the decline of independent institutions. And three, the shrinking space for political dissent and freedom of press, which has been curtailed by the criminalization of, of dissent. Each of these issues is significant in its own right, but when taken together, they do constitute a major risk to Indian democracy. My lecture this evening then will try, is try, will try to make sense of these shifts through a thematic, not chronological, but through a th thematic analysis of the trajectory uh, of Indian democracy after 2014, focusing on the three principal developments that I've just mentioned, which I argue has undermined democracy through this intersection of majoritarianism and, uh, and authoritarianism. Now, these trends are not just alarming, but also seem to be more durable than the episodic ex excesses that marked the emergency of the mid-1970s. However, and I will end with, with this uh, at the end of this lecture, and that is that public protests, which have grown uh, significantly in the past uh, two to three years, have proved to be a major bulwark uh, against authoritarian rule and the dilution of democratic dissent. So I'll now uh, go on to speak about the three areas of concern that I just identified. The first one is the consolidation of majoritarian politics. Now, the decisive victory of the BJP in 2019 reinforced the right-wing trajectory India had embarked upon in 2014. The party's top leadership interpreted the verdict as a signal to establish uh, a Hindu state, which was the declared objective of the RSS on its founding in 1925. This was a project of making India a Hindu nation state, that is to say, a state driven largely and sometimes solely by the interests of a religious majority. This project has worked via a process of consolidation of Hindu dominance through authoritarian means and the restrictions it imposes on the rights of minorities, primarily Muslims. Now, this has served to polarize the electorate by creating a permissive climate which has enabled a politics of division and fear to build up. Now, this change, of course, did not start in uh, 2014. But what is novel, however, is, uh, is its overall vision of India informed by a Hindu definition of the nation in opposition to secularism enshrined in the constitution and equally uh, by its opposition relentless opposition to minorities. 
uh, particularly Muslims. That vision has driven a public discourse in which minorities are openly vilified and has encouraged tolerance of extra legal violence against them. And thus Muslims have been lynched for trading and eating beef, uh, their businesses have been attacked and uh, sympathetic, sympathetic trolls have been let loose on Muslim women in public life uh, and so on. Uh, now, many of these, uh, many of these campaigns and attacks have been spearheaded by the Bajrang Dal and these active and the, and the vigilantism that they have indulged in and cultural uh, policing through physical threats and intimidation, often translating into uh, violence. Now, these groups, particularly uh, and the Bajrang Dal and the Akhil ABVP, they've played a key part in ad advancing the ruling party's majoritarian agenda of making India a Hindu nation. Now, things moved fast after 2019 and the re-election of this government. Uh, the party used its electoral mandate to justify major policy changes that break from the established consensus arguing that these were part of its election manifesto, which now had a democratic imprimatur to go ahead with it. The government pushed through uh, a series of laws uh, in quick succession, which had a direct impact on the constitutional concept of equal treatment. The breathtaking advance of majoritarian politics was apparent in three major developments that I shall mention very briefly. Uh, now, thanks to the BJP's overwhelming majority in the Lok Sabha, several bills were passed that advanced this agenda. The government began with the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A of the Constitution, which defined and protected uh, the status of Jammu and Kashmir. In one stroke, the state ceased to exist and came under virtual military occupation with all means of communication and normal day-to-day -day life uh, disrupted. Even after more than two years, now almost it's going to be three years uh, this August, uh, the situation is far from normal in uh, the state. And the whole exercise is still widely regarded as a violation of the constitution and its procedures and the matter is before the supreme court but needless to say the supreme court has not yet uh, examined uh, the issue now citizens uh, the second issue is citizenship uh, provisions uh, and which have been uh, amended citizenship provisions in independent india avoided any communal or religious identification adopting a birth based rather than descent based model this was changed after the enactment of the Citizenship Amendment Act in December uh, 2019. Now, the amended law quickly occupied the center stage of Indian politics because it uh, sought to uh, or it seeks to fast track citizenship to non-Muslim minorities in, from Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh by creating an exemption from the illegal migrants category for Hindus, Sikhs, uh, Buddhists, Jains, Parsis, and, and Christians, but does not offer the same exemption to refugees and my immigrants who happen to be Muslims. Now, for the ruling party, this was, of course, almost as important an issue uh, as the abrogation of Article uh, 370, uh, which is to say for the ruling party, the Citizenship Amendment Act was the culmination of a long overdue project which envisioned India to be the natural abode for all uh, Hindus. This, of course, runs contrary to the inclusive idea of India uh, that, uh, that was enshrined uh, in uh, the Constitution. Uh, this provoked major protests uh, across the country, which lasted uh, three months. Uh, and to some extent, it has had an impact insofar as the Citizenship Amendment Act is as of now sort of frozen, so to speak, and the government has not really uh, moved, uh, moved forward. It hasn't withdrawn it, but it is also effectively not being implemented. 
The third significant development related to the Supreme Court's verdict, which pronounced that the disputed land in Ayodhya uh, would go to a government monitored trust to build a temple and Muslims would receive a separate five acre plot of land in the city to build a mosque. The apex court thus ensured that that a temple would be built on the land where the mosque, uh, the Babli mosque once stood, which by the court's own admission was illegally demolished. The greater significance of, the, <clears throat> of this judgment, uh, a far-reaching and historic judgment, lies in the tacit endorsement of majoritarian politics by the highest court, assigning to the central government the task of setting up a Hindu religious trust uh, to build a Ram temple implies that it was the government's duty to cater to Hindu religious interests. So the court ruling was a huge victory for the ruling party, which had made the construction of a grand Ram temple a focal point of its uh, uh, political campaign. Uh, it's clear that this would not have been possible without the indulgence of uh, the Supreme Court. At a political level, these events, these three events, and actions are not merely tactics to consolidate the BJP's Hindu vote. They are strategic moves to push Indian democracy towards majoritarianism and the consolidation of Hindu supremacy. It has driven a public discourse which has seen an official marginalization and exclusion of Muslims. It was no secret that Muslims were already the most underrepresented group in public institutions in India. They have been completely edged out of power structures in the past uh, now almost eight uh, years. The BJP has shown that over 200 million Muslims don't count and electoral majorities can be won without their support. This is the BJP's greatest political success. So in this sense, then Muslims have been pushed out of the system first by rendering them irrelevant electorally, and then rendering them invisible in the public sphere, owing to their electoral inconsequentiality. This brings me to the second area of concern, and that is the decline of institutions, which I consider to be really the most serious issue confronting our democracy today. In addition to majoritarian politics, the contemporary political order is basically authoritarian and extremely centralized. The common thread running through the process is prime ministerial control of political institutions. It is the prime minister's office that takes all major decisions, often leaving cabinet ministers to learn of their ministry's priorities, uh, sometimes from the media or through some central diktat. The disastrous demonetization in November 2016 was an example of this style of functioning. Many senior cabinet ministers were unaware of the demonetization decision until shortly before it was announced, which highlighted the fact uh, that the prime minister's office is really the sole power center. Top-down control has affected all public institutions, which are intended to check the exercise of executive power, not the, uh, not the least investigative and coercive agencies, whilst tightening control over them. The state and its uh, agencies have been used to the fullest extent possible for dominating all the power centers, uh, including state governments. In fact, federalism has become a very fraught issue in India as a result of this. Uh, the government has tried to prevail over the country's institutions either by constraining their power or by limiting their independence. This has been done through the appointment of people loyal to the regime. And in many cases, positions have been filled by trusted bureaucrats who have worked with the prime minister in uh, Gujarat. Although institutions have always had to negotiate with political rulers, and there have been periods in India's past 
when things came to a flashpoint as during the emergency, but never before institutions have had to function for political ends to this extent when there's no formal declaration of emergency. The powerful executive has come to dominate most uh, branches of government, including and especially parliament. Uh, in fact, one might uh, suggest that this whole process of decline really began with the abandonment of any meaningful discussion in parliament, thus undermining its uh, significance. The erosion of the autonomy of the election commission of India is part of the uh, same story of declining autonomy of institutions. High stake elections invariably throw up situations where the election commission doesn't just have to be fair, it also has to appear to be fair and neutral. This position has unfortunately been compromised by the erosion of the election commission's credibility owing to decisions that are seen to be supportive of uh, the ruling party, especially its top uh, leadership. And there are numerous examples. I really don't have the time to uh, cite uh, those examples. Critics point to the breaches of the model code of conduct that haven't been dealt with impartially and firmly, thus giving a fillip to the process of majoritarianism. Appeals to religious and caste sentiments violate the model code and should attract action from the commission. But the commission has not really taken action uh, to stop this. Uh, and, and again, this has happened partly because, uh, the, uh, because of the appointment of what critics call client election commissioners, a tactic that has affected just about all institutions and, and most sadly, it has affected academic institutions above all. Uh, so the declining autonomy of this vital institution, that is the election commission, has unleveled the playing field and contributed to distortions in electoral uh, politics. And I'd like to give one example here, and that is of the electoral bonds, which is completely uh, non-transparent electoral bonds, 90% of which uh, money has gone to the ruling party. The election commission, when the bo electoral bonds were mm, introduced in 2017, had clearly expressed serious reservations about it. But since then, the election commission has fallen in line and it has changed uh, its position against the matter. Again, the matter is before the Supreme Court. And as in the case of uh, the Kashmir issue, uh, the application of Article 370 on the electoral bonds too, the Supreme Court has not found uh, the time to examine uh, the validity of this. And I consider the electoral bonds issue the most serious issue in unleveling and unequaling the playing field, uh, um, playing field of democracy in India. If parliament and the election commission is no longer an effective check on the executive, much the same can be said for the judiciary. The Supreme Court was until recently one of the most powerful courts in the world. And, some, uh, and an institution that we were all proud of, as indeed of the election commission. But critics, I think, point out that it has abdicated some of its independence, uh, notwithstanding uh, its complete control over the formal processes of appointments to the higher uh, courts. The Supreme Court's role in the production of the NRC, the National Register of Citizens in Assam, its judgment in the Ayodhya dispute, its apparent lack of urgency in hearing the challenges against uh, 370, against the CAA, and the electoral bonds issue that I just mentioned, suggest a, seem to be part of a pattern as the court has simply avoided pronouncing on controversial issues that strongly affect government interests. Uh, in fact, the court did not even take up habeas corpus petitions. As a result, uh, people languished in jail for months in uh, Kashmir. During the term of four of its successive chief justices, the court stopped opposing 
the executive either by dismissing potentially embarrassing petitions or simply abstaining from taking, uh, taking up a court case for months or years. Whether this can be explained in terms of government pressure, appointment of client judges, and ideological affinities on many issues, such as Ayodhya, the Uniform Civil Code, the illegal migrants issue, uh, and so on, is an open uh, question. But clearly the NRC and possibly Ayodhya are striking examples in which chief justices have expressed the same viewpoint as that of the ruling uh, party. The fact that key institutions seem to have been captured by people who share, at least in part, the worldview of the ruling ideology, and in some cases are even connected to the ruling dispensation, suggests the entrenchment of Hindu dominance inside the state. It could be argued that Hindu do dominance existed for a long time, but that was outside the state and its uh, structures. Now it is entrenched inside, uh, inside the state. And in the event, the playing field has been tilted to the advantage of those in power. This brings me to the third uh, issue, and that is the more also very, very important, and that is the shrinking space for political dissent. In a sense, all three issues that we are talking about are interconnected. Now, neutralizing and restricting the opposition is an avowed objective of authoritarian governments everywhere. This is not unique to India. This government has used the electoral mandate to dispense with consultation altogether on issues of national importance. The BJP has routinely denied the legitimacy of political opponents, most notably the Congress uh, party, as evident from the explicit objective of a Congress-free India. And the Prime Minister's two recent speeches uh, just the, uh, this week uh, in the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, in fact, underline uh, the, point, uh, the point that I'm making, that clearly there is an attempt to work uh, towards an opposition-free and certainly a Congress-free uh, India. And the whole idea seems to be to move towards one nation, one party. That seems to be uh, the goal of this relentless, mm, relentless attacks on the Congress party, because that is really uh, the chief opposition at the, uh, uh, at the national uh, level. So the ultimate aim then, as I said, is to create a political system with one nation, one uh, party. And this has been more or less explicitly stated uh, by, uh, by the ruling party uh, at one of its national executive meetings uh, in 2017 where the party, that is the BJP, discussed the contours of an India without an opposition and opponents. Now, this is something that is unimaginable, but they actually discussed, uh, discussed uh, sort of this template, uh, uh, so to speak. Now, today, there's no emergency. Uh, there's no press censorship, formally. There's no lawful suspension of laws. But the curbing of dissent is taking place through a combination of coercive and non-coercive means. Coercive means include the criminalization of dissent through the sedition provisions of the penal code and non-coercive uh, means include efforts to roll back civil society by using a law on foreign funding of N NGOs, uh, uh, NGOs and non-governmental organizations. Uh, now, uh, the latest measure in this, uh, in this uh, is, um, was in 2020, when the Foreign Contribution, the FCRA, the Foreign Contributions Regulation Act uh, amendment was introduced in parliament. And we can see the results of that amendment. That is in the last five years, from 2017 to 2021, FCRA registration certificates of almost 1,900 NGOs or associates registered under the social category have been canceled 
this was, was the information given by the government to parliament just last week. So we can see the scale at which uh, this whole uh, curbs on NGOs and civil society is happening. FCR is clearly a handy weapon that is used by the government to rein in pesky uh, critics, and it has been used against a, a very large number of very well-known institute um, organizations like and i'll mention just one the lawyers collective uh, uh in delhi headed by indira uh indira jersing a leading leading uh lawyer in the country uh for violating the fcra uh this is almost two years now and the case and they uh, no sorry it is actually uh five years and uh their uh, bank accounts stand frozen even as we uh, as we uh, speak. Another uh, example I can mention is the Amnesty International, which had to virtually shut shop as its accounts were uh, frozen. And in the case of the Amnesty International, it is worth noting that it happened soon after uh, the Amnesty uh, released its report detailing ground realities of the riots in Northeast Delhi in uh, February uh, uh, in uh, February of 2020 and also after its report on uh, uh, on the situation in Kashmir after the abrogation of article 370 now but besides this the government also resorts to repressive tactics to stifle public protest and I'll just mention uh, very quickly just one example and that is uh, the most blatant display of such tactics were, was witnessed in response to the protests against the Citizenship, uh, Citizenship Amendment Act. And the, uh, even though international and national concern was expressed regarding its discriminatory uh, uh, features, yet the government completely ignored or rejected this concern and turned a deaf, uh, deaf ear to this protest. But that was not all. In fact, it went on to actually uh, arrest uh, dozens of uh, activists uh, and protesters, uh, and many of them were uh, arrested under the stringent unlawful uh, activities Pre prevention act, the UAPA. Uh, now, despite reports of excessive use of force in universities, such as the Jawaharlal Nehru University, the Jamia Millia Islamia, the Aligarh Muslim University, and on students, uh, student activists in many other uh, uh, places as well. Uh, uh, I mean, so despite uh, reports of excessive use of force on protesters and the dismantling of peaceful protests, police forces to date have not been uh, penalized. No action has been taken against uh, police excesses, even when they virtually raided a library in, uh, in an institution in uh, Delhi. So the new political order then seeks uh, dominance by fighting not only against party-based uh, opposition, but also uh, uh, dissenting intellectuals, universities, independent journalists, and so on. And uh, this has taken the form of attacks against liberals and in intellectuals and against universities like my own, uh, the Jawaharlal Nehru University and other uh, liberal institutions through an attempt at saffronization of uh, education. The point is that the atmosphere in universities has been vitiated and disagreements have been stifled to a point of choking critical uh, inquiry and the right to engage with ideas the ruling dispensation disapproves of. The media's independence, which is the other major institution, has been seriously curbed by a variety of restrictions. In fact, uh, a very recent seminar, just about uh, 10 days back at the Press Club of India on uh, the new challenges before the media to commemorate the 64th Foundation Day of the Press Club of India uh, expressed great concern at the unprecedented existential threat faced by uh, the media in India. It pointed out that the current dispensation is preventing media persons from collecting news. Uh, and 
in fact, uh, it went on to say, and I put it in, I, I put it in quotes, that they have sought to create liberated zones where, where journalists are denied access. For example, uh, in parliament, they cannot now go to uh, South Block or North Block or to ministry uh, offices and so on. All these are sort of no-go uh, zones uh, or what are called the liberated zones, uh, so to speak, for, uh, for the media. Uh, and but most concerning really is uh, are the restrictions on covering parliament, which is now re restricted despite uh, strong opposition by top journalist bodies. Now, what is very ironic is that there's this huge expansion of media and, and India clearly has one of the largest media uh, medias in, in the world. And there's an exponential growth of media outlets. But instead of increasing, uh, as it were, opinions or access to information and, uh, and so on, uh, ironically, the exponential growth of media outlets has actually narrowed rather than expanded the channels for expression of varied uh, opinions. And this is because a systematic effort has been made to discipline the media through criminal defamation by using various regulatory agencies to target media houses and uh, journalists. The electronic media is almost entirely dominated by pro-government channels uh, that have to use, uh, to use the word of a journalist, uh, Josie Joseph, completely sold out, either because of ideological affinities or economic uh, dependence. Clearly, corporate control is a major reason, but that alone cannot explain the shrill pro-government tone of many television channels and, new, uh, main, uh, and uh, mainstream media and newspapers. The same corporate sector, after all, controlled the same media uh, seven or eight years ago. Then they were freely going after the United Progressive Alliance government, whereas now the media readily express, uh, accepts the government line and interrogates principally the opposition rather than the government. This is rather unusual by, by any standard for any media in any part of the world. So what is new is that private capital has signed up, I would argue, to a project of aligning the media with the ideological purposes of the state. So they are now, in the words of Pratap Mehta, the ideological vanguard of the state in a politics of communalism, polarization, distraction, anti-intellectualism, and hate. So now, curbs, it could be argued, and I would uh, go along with that view, that curbs on democratic dissent are not new. Previous governments, too, made things difficult uh, for dissenting voices or for protest uh, movements. The midnight arrest of yoga entrepreneur Baba Ramdev by the Delhi police at Ramlila Maidan in June 2011, where he had organized a protest against the UPA government's inaction on the black money issue, was a clear case of government overreach, as were the sedition cases in Kudankulam in Tamil Nadu. However, there is a sense in which these negative trends have accentuated or sharpened, marking an unprecedented attack on the politics of dissent. The scale and intensity of restrictions is much greater now than before, with the exception of the emergency, of course. Also, what is significantly different under the present dispensation is the wider ambience of intolerance encouraged by the volatile combination of religion and nationalism with the explicit backing of state power. What further differentiates this regime is the space it provides for the construction of an enemy within, and thus the term anti-national has gained such widespread conspiracy. Anyone who disagrees with the government is anti-national. So what differentiates this regime is the space 
It provides for the construction of an enemy within, which it needs in order for majoritarianism to thrive. This includes uh, the portrayal of, uh, of any anti-government position, protest or agitation as anti-national. The enemy within is accused of being, uh, is then subjected to harassment and in some cases to long periods of incarceration. One of the consequences of this approach is that the national security advisor can publicly say to the police that civil society is now the new frontier of war. This attitude reflects the fact that the government or some of its ideologues have begun to see civil society, uh, civil society dissenters and people who think differently as enemies of the nation. Indeed, the prime minister quite recently uh, criticized the very idea of rights. The he, he pointed out uh, that, the focus, that there's been too much focus on rights in India and that this focus has made India weak. And I quote, uh, this is about uh, just about uh, two or three weeks ago. And he said that in the last 75 years, we only kept talking about rights, fighting for rights and wasting time. The, the talk of rights, he said, to some extent for some time may be right in a particular circumstance, but forgetting one's duties completely has played a huge role in keeping India weak. In these circumstances, given what the National Security Advisor said and what the Prime Minister has said about rights, uh, it is hardly surprising that any protest that seeks to challenge uh, the government or is critical of the regime is deemed as injurious to help. One major consequence, and this is one of my central, uh, if you will, the fourth point, um, uh, of a fourth concern, although I did not identify it at the outset. And that is that one of the major consequences of a weakened democracy with ineffective checks and balances is that India is one of the most unequal countries, uh, one of the most unequal countries for both income and wealth, and has shown the most rapid increases in inequality, where the rich have gotten richer and the poor poorer, enhancing the divide between two Indias. Uh, the, this emerges clearly from two recent reports on inequalities. The World Inequality Report 2022, produced by the Paris-based uh, World Inequality Report, which is the most important institution working on the question of inequality in the world uh, today. It notes that India stands out as a, as a poor and very unequal country with an affluent elite, where the top 10% holds 57% of the total national income, while the bottom 50% share is just 13%. Oxfam India uh, also published uh, just after the uh, World Inequality Lab report, published in January, just about a few weeks ago, uh, a report which says that the richest 98 Indians control as much wealth as some 555 million poor people in India, which is almost one third, uh, one third of India, so to speak. And of course, the number of billionaires have grown from 102 to 142. And the wealth of these 142 billionaires, or persons, I should say, was, I can't even ca uh, count the zeros, uh, well, it is 53, I mean, it's a humongous amount. Meanwhile, more than 4.6 crore Indians have fallen into extreme poverty in 2020, nearly half of the global new poor, according to the United Nations. But until recently, India had shown that it could not, that it would not only practice democracy, but also deliver in ample measure to all its citizens, irrespective of religion, caste, gender, race, and ethnicity. Indeed, uh, India lifted 271 million Indians out of poverty 
between 2006 and 2016. The substantial gains that India had made in terms of poverty reduction are under threat of reversal. The reversal has to be seen, I would argue, in the backdrop of the growth of Hindu nationalism and its inability to conceive of equal citizenship and equal participation as the foundation of growth, development, and democracy. This has been combined with the forceful, with the pursuit of a forceful pro-corporate agenda that involves huge large-scale privatization of a range of uh, public assets from railway stations, ports, airports, to stadia and roads. As uh, uh, a rather um, strong article by Professor Prabhat Patnaik said, everything is on sale in India uh, today. And I think that just about sums up uh, the extent of um, privatization. This policy resulted from, has resulted from the assumption that priority must be given to removing state controls from economic activity rather than assisting uh, the poor. The ideologues of Hindu nationalism, it is important to note, never ever refer to, uh, to distributive justice or the word equality. In fact, it would be very interesting to find out whether the word equality has ever figured in the speeches of, uh, the, of the Prime Minister. Instead of developing redistributive policies, the government is invested in policies that promote wealth accumulation and for the poor, a politics of dignity aimed at endowing them with self-esteem than improving their welfare and well-being. Not surprisingly, uh, this strategy has failed to combat inequalities. In fact, mass poverty, inequality, and uh, unemployment have increased significantly. Now, against this uh, backdrop, I want to end on a more optimistic uh, note and uh, want to point, uh, want to sort of uh, suggest uh, that there is growing resistance to to what we have been faced with over the past uh, seven or eight years. Now, tracking the journey of the majoritarian authoritarian regime in India suggests four broad conclusions. First, the abrogation of Article 370 in Jammu and Kashmir, the introduction of CAA and, CAA, and the Supreme Court verdict on uh, the Ayodhya dispute affirmed Hindu hegemony over the state at the expense of secularism. Second, majoritarianism has clipped uh, the wings of the political opposition, just as their ideological positions sometimes converge with the dominant idiom of uh, majoritarianism in national politics. Third, the close connection between authoritarianism and majoritarianism has resulted in the marginalization and exclusion of Muslims from the institutional framework of our society and polity. Uh, fourth, the government has intensified its control over key institutions which have facilitated and legitimized this uh, authoritarian regime. Now, the decline in the checks and balances intended to restrain executive power is a consequence of the emasculation of key institutions that were in a position to balance government's power. Christoph Joffel, whom I mentioned in the beginning, concludes his magisterial account, a brilliant account of Hindu nationalism in his recent book, uh, Modi's India, contending uh, that authoritarianism has not uh, faced vigorous uh, resistance in India. And he gives some reasons why that is so. But I would suggest that while, while he's right, that opposition could have been stronger, it is not as strong as it should have been, and opposition parties have offered weak resistance uh, to Hindu uh, nationalism, but there is a growing resistance at the non-party level. Notwithstanding restrictions on mass action, several modes of public protest have gained momentum. Indeed, public protests under BJP rule have 
occurred with increasing frequency and intensity. It has been more frequent in the government's second term in office since 2019. The government's response has been predictable, ranging from reluctant, uh, well, ranging from reluctant accommodation to uh, largely ignoring or suppressing it. Now, these protests, I would suggest, mark a significant pushback against authoritarianism. Three recent protests, one of which I have already mentioned, are especially significant. Uh, the first one uh, is against the CAA. The second, this extraordinary uh, farmers movement, really extraordinary, the world's largest, longest uh, farmers movement, which lasted more than a year. Uh, uh, and the third, and quite significant, I think, and that is the recent unemployment riots that broke out in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. As a result of these protests, the government has been forced to either stall or reverse its proposed policies in some cases. The controversial farm laws were withdrawn uh, in 2021, uh, thanks to the farmers' movement and the public pressure mounted by it. Speaking truth to power, as these movements have done uh, so forcefully, will embolden others to speak out too. Rahul Gandhi's speech in the Lok Sabha on the president's address on 2nd February already marked a big change. These are signs of many discontented and uh, discontented and concerned forces at the party and non-party level coming together and interrupting Hindu nationalism's narrative by forging new solidarities, fighting for their rights as they faced up, as they have, have had to face up to the might of an authoritarian regime. So a central political dynamic that is emerging and noticeable is that there is today a struggle between two forces the continued dominance of Hindu nationalism at the center on the one hand, and the interruptions to its legitimacy by political movements and the BJP's defeat at the hands of regional parties in several state elections held after 2017 on the other. The social movement dynamic, I mentioned three movements, has so far interrupted and possibly uh, halted the implementation of the CAA. The repeal of farm laws marks a straight political defeat for the government, which for months was insisting that its reform package, that is these three laws would benefit farmers, but in the end, it had to yield uh, to the determined uh, farmers uh, movement. So the farmers movement, uh, I would argue, is a vindication of Indian democracy exemplified by a mass protest that successfully challenged a very powerful government. This shows that despite all the curbs and restrictions on dissent and protest, Indians have not been silenced. Whether it is the anti-CAA protesters rallying across the country, or the farmers camping at Delhi's borders, or students and youth protesting against the state's failure to provide employment, people are making their presence felt and determinedly staking a claim to democratic participation. Thank you very much. Wow, such a wonderful lecture. Quite revealing as well as informative very inspiring and some, somewhat depressing also where we are heading. But at the same time, uh, this gives us some strength also that in spite of all this depressing situation, people are rising up, trying to make a difference. So let's hear uh, Professor uh, Amrita Basu for concluding remarks. And after that, we will have a question and answer session. Thank you. Eagerly waiting, eagerly waiting to hear Amrita. Yes. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Razuddin, for inviting me to join this forum. Thank you, Mujibur, for your very gracious introductory remarks. 
And above all, thank you, Zoya, for uh, your, as usual, incisive, trenchant remarks. I just have such respect for you as a scholar. And I think increasingly in the recent past, your analyses have been hard hitting, have been courageous and all as well substantiated. Um, one of the things I really liked about your paper, which you talked about in your concluding section is you provided a critique of democracy um, of the way in which democratic erosion in India results both from growing class inequalities and po persistent poverty, as well as the dismantling of representative institutions and the concentration of power in the executive. And although of course in your paper, you um, appropriately spent more time on the second set of issues, I think it's really important that we attend to both. Um, I agree with most of what you have to say. So for purposes of stimulating discussion though, I'm going to raise four questions, a couple of which register gentle disagreements to, to provoke further discussion. So the first, um, Zoya, has to do with the extent to which or the links between the erosion of democracy and authoritarianism. And what you said just now in your remarks is, and I'm going to quote you, Authoritarianism is both the means and the end, thus creating a vicious cycle between provocative events and decisions and political outcomes through a blend of majoritarianism and authoritarianism. And you spoke uh, later about the subjugation of democracy as a result of the intersection of majoritarianism and authoritarianism. Now, I um, am fully in agreement with you about um, the descent to authoritarianism. And I think one of the very interesting points you made is that that might be masked for some by virtue of the fact that an emergency hasn't been declared. So in, past, in the past, when we had a state of emergency, the authoritarian nature of the government was very clear, perhaps less so now. But where I have a question is the, the comment you made about authoritarianism being the means. I think it's the end, but not necessarily the means. And here I would say that to me, what, um, and I want to go back to Mujibur's comments as well about this, um, I would characterize this regime as populist. And I think one of the distinctive features of populist regimes is that however authoritarian they may be, they don't come to power through coup d'etats, they don't come to power through military rule, they come to power through elections by seeking a popular mandate. And they claim actually to be better Democrats than their predecessors. So often I think populist regimes tap into deep um, grievances against the prior political establishment. Of course, they exacerbate those grievances and manufacture some of those grievances as well. Um, but I think it's important that um, the, the problem lies in the way in which they respond to those grievances, not in the fact that those grievances exist. And here, uh, Vajib, I want to go back to your comments too, when you said that you disagreed with some scholars who characterized India as a populist regime. I too disagree with those who want to paint populist regimes with a broad brushstroke and suggest that all populist regimes are the same. They come to power for the same reasons. When in fact, I think populists are only successful when they embed their appeals within the particularities of the national context or of national histories. And I agree with you completely with the comments you made about the significance of looking at this regime within uh, the context of, of Indian history. But I do think that there is something significant in, uh, about this, thinking about something helpful about thinking about this as a populist regime, because it helps me at least see why a re this regime may have achieved some support because it claimed to be less corrupt, more democratic than its predecessors. And the descent towards authoritarianism has been gradual. It hasn't taken place. It didn't take place all at once in 2014. So that leads me to a second question, Zoya, and that is what are the grievances that the BJP is tapping into? Um, you said in your paper, and I'm gonna quote from you again, until recently, democracy in India was doing well even though Indian democracy has faced serious challenges most conspicuously during the emergency and from persistent social inequalities, political conflicts, violence and assassinations and so on, it has shown significant resilience during the second, seven decades since independence. Um, 
So what, so my question is, to what extent do you think the BJP owes its victory in 2014 to grievances that people had against the UPA government and the, and the uh, Congress regime in particular? How significant do you think the dis dissatisfaction was with corruption in the UPA regime? How significant do you think um, dissatisfaction was with the dynasticism of the Congress party? And of course, this is something the BJP very effectively plays upon and Modi does as well in presenting himself as an Aam Admi, as a Kamdar rather than a Namdar. So it's both Modi's spin on it, but it is also, I think to me, it seems that there is something that he's tapping here that's significant. Um, and actually in the course of the discussion, um, Khalid had a comment saying, how much is this, um, how, how should we make sense of this as reflecting support at a grassroots level for the BJP? Or is this a sort of, I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing your words, Khalid, but, or is this top down, in which case it seems less dangerous? Um, it does seem to me that it's important to look at why it, some of those popular schemes that Modi has introduced, even though they've been poorly implemented and poorly funded, have been quite popular. And it also seems important to look at the way Modi has distanced himself from the work of his political allies. His response has been silent acquiescence, but it has not been boisterous acclaim. That's not to say that Modi doesn't endorse these actions. I think he fully does. But I think it's also important in, in at least in, in one step towards understanding Modi's popularity. Third question I want to ask is something about which I have no answer, but sorry, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts. And that is, why is it that the national opposition or opposition by national political parties to the BJP has been so weak? Where is the left? What's happened to left political parties? Um, and Although certainly repression plays some role, repression can't be the full answer in understanding and explaining why opposition has been so weak. Do you see more hopes for opposition at the regional level? And if so, in which regional context? And I know it's early to say, but to what extent do you feel hopes for opposition reemerging in UP? And then my final question has to do with the role of protest movements. Um, so you said, Zoya, that there's reason to be optimistic to growing resistance to this regime. And you spoke very movingly about three forms of resistance, the anti-CAA protest, uh, the farmers movement, of course, and um, the protests against unemployment in UP and Bihar. And I agree with you that these are very inspiring examples. I think they're inspiring and their significance is symbolic as well as the concrete Yield, um, way in which the, the government has yielded to the demands, especially of the farmers' movements, but at least has, you know, frozen um, the CAA. I guess my question is, um, do you think, though? Uh, well, I, well, my worry is that the regime has far, been far more willing to really yield fully to the farmers' movement and to the CAA protests, even though it, it marks a step that it's put it on pause. And that just seems to me because the CAA, the passage of the CAA is crucial to this Hindu nationalist regime and its attempt to create a Hindu majoritarian state. So my question is, do you think that protest, do you think it's possible that protests around questions of unemployment or the farmers protest are more likely to be more successful than protests which really challenge Hindu nationalist, Hindu majoritarianism, Hindu nationalist domination? Um, and more broadly, what kinds of additional protests do you imagine, do you, do you anticipate? What, to what extent do you think that the farmers movement will also encourage other acts of protest around a broader range of issues? So I'll stop there. Thank you, Zoya, for giving us so much food for thought. Thank you so much for all the thoughts that you expressed. Uh, so now what we will do is there is a question and answer session which basically is for the audience to ask questions, since you have raised questions also. So I will request uh, Professor Zoya that all your questions can be compounded at the end of this session as a summary for a few minutes. But before that we go, here are two upcoming uh, events coming Saturday, 
will be our um, Dr. Rakshinda Jalil, a very famous scholar on Urdu literature. She is going to be speaking on progressive writers movement in Urdu that is coming on Saturday. And the left poster is a early uh, promotion. This is our going to be a big event, a live stage show on the last Mushara in the Mughal court of Bahadur Shah Zafar. Uh, presenting Ghalib, Momin, Da, Zok, and Bahadur Shah himself. So this is which we are, we are waiting since two months. And finally, Danish Akbal is able to put it together. Uh, hopefully, we will see it on February 26. So let us back to the event. Um, uh, our colleague and host, Dr. Rafat Hussain, is the moderator of this session. He will take questions. He will brief you how to uh, raise hands and all those. And at the end, I request that Dr. Zoya conclude that and put together all the themes that Professor Basu also raised. Thank you very much. And Rafat. Thank you, Raji Bhai. And uh, th thank you all for attending the session. Uh, so first, I would like to thank uh, Professor Mujibur Rahman for introducing, beautifully introducing uh, the Professor Hassan. And uh, of course, uh, Professor Hassan for analyzing uh, what is happening to democracy in India. And uh, uh, Professor Basu has put a lot of interesting questions or thoughtful questions, and rather say the pointed questions and uh, Professor Hassan will uh, address them in the end of uh, uh, the session. So this uh, question and answer session is uh, most of you, those who are seasoned, <laughs> see the seasoned attendees uh, know how to ask the question. So, but those who are new, please uh, raise your digital hand or show your interest in the chat box. And I will monitor both and uh, will ask, uh, will give you the chance according to the sequence you ask the question or ask the yes. So the first person who showed the interest is uh, Khalisa. Khalisa, please unmute yourself. Okay, next person is uh, Nazir Ahmed Sahab. I will come back to Khalid Sahab again. Nazir Sahab. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zoya Hassan for a brilliant and incisive expose of the current state of democracy in India. I'm Dr. Nazir Ahmed, former member of Karnataka Legislative Assembly, Bangalore. My question relates to the interface between the state and the citizen in the Indian constitution. Any legislation has an intent, an implementation, and a consequence. The ban on hijab in government schools in Karnataka may turn out to be a seminal event in the constitutional history of India. It is a flex point in the evolution of Hindutva. The event may mark the outermost reach of political Hindutva, or it could be the beginning of a much more virulent confrontation with the minorities leading to a tragedy of biblical proportions. The defining moment of this episode is not the lectures of professors or the arguments of TV anchors, but the courageous stand taken by a teenage girl against a menacing mob of howling, hounding men. With that one stand, the Karnataka girl has changed the dynamics of the minority majority dialectic. The message is clear. There will be resistance in the future. It was a moment of pride for all of us who love India. India is alive. My question is this, ma'am. The Indian constitution reflects to a large extent a Nehruvian penchant for socialist, political, 
and economic centration. The residual rights are vested in the state and the individual has to fight for the rights in the courts. Where do you see the constitution drawing a line between the draconian breach of the state and the individual rights to privacy, culture, faith, family, clothes, food, marriage, and religion? Thank you, ma'am. So thank you, Nazir Saab, and thank you um, in advance to Professor Hassan. I just wanted to remind that we have reserved like a half an hour. And I tell you, Zoya and Professor Saiba, that there are so much interest in asking questions. And I have already tens of questions lined up. So please be brief. And I also request to people who are asking questions, just a pointed question directly. Most of us here know the background. So please be brief so we can cover most of the people. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Professor Hassan. Okay. Or you, or, or you want to lump uh, some, bah, please go ahead one by one. So uh, should I start with Amrita's? Uh, uh, if, there is some, if there is some part of that, you can cover here. And hopefully, because there are more than 10 people are lined up, and uh, eventually you will cover most of the things. If not, in the end, you cover Professor Basu's uh, questions also, as you okay. wish. All right, so if I am, uh, okay, I'll address Professor Basu at the end then. Uh, at the moment, there's only one question, which is by uh, the question on the interface between citizen and state. And I think the point that was made is, uh, uh, that the constitu uh, constitution empowers the state and not individual, which is not quite true. I think the uh, individual rights are significant, but yes, uh, in India, there is this tension between group rights and individual rights, and now between the state and individual rights. So I think you're quite right in putting your finger on an emerging uh, problem, which is when you have an overweening state uh, sort of imposing itself. But at the same time, I think there is a fight back and the privacy judgment uh, of just a couple of uh, two years back uh, is a very significant uh, assertion of individual rights. And in fact, the Karnataka case uh, of uh, the, I mean, the hijab case is uh, to some extent being seen as a violation of uh, the uh, of that uh, judgment. So now I think uh, on the on the Karnataka case, the matter is still, uh, as you as you have also pointed out, is developing and is is still a developing story, so to speak. But uh, clearly, uh, but clearly, uh, there is, as we can see, I don't think the uh, the conflict is really as much as uh, to do with. Well, of course, it has to do with with the uh, constitution and. The matter is before the Karnataka High Court, and eventually it might well go uh, to the su Supreme Court. So far, the Supreme Court is uh, has uh, not taken a stand and is waiting probably for uh, the Karnataka uh, 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 Karnataka uh, verdict on this. But I do think that uh, the position that the Karnataka High Court has taken uh, so far is uh, somewhat uh, problematic, in that it has said that. Uh, uh, the schools will open uh, um, on Monday, but these girls will not be able to uh, wear uh, the yeah. Uh, yeah the dress or the clothes of their choice. That is uh, that is a, a violation of their um, fundamental rights to some extent. But I think this is very clearly a, a, a con. Uh, I mean, this is a political conflict. It's not just about, uh, it's not just uh, yeah, in individual rights, but but the whole, uh, the uh, because after all, I mean, as of what one has been able to understand, these girls were wearing uh, a hijab to the pre-university college for the past, uh, two, uh, past two or three years. Then suddenly one teacher decides that she finds this unacceptable and then the snowballed into a big controversy. But it would not have snowballed into a big controversy if there wasn't the kind of organized political opposition uh, 
by uh, by the political right or the Hindu right. And so like on so many other issues, this is again a conflict between, if you, write, uh, if you will, the forces of uh, the Hindu right and, uh, and uh, secularism. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hassan. Shahid Anwar Saab or Khalid yeah. Saab. Is Khalid Saab back? Thank you. Oh, yes, Thank you, Dr. Saab, for your brilliant presentation. Uh, my question is uh, uh, a little bit different regarding the very model of parliamentary system. Uh, don't you think that Parli Westminster parliamentary system offers no structural checks on the possible abuse of power by the prime minister? Thank you. Well, but um, I mean, you're right. It does not, uh, I mean, the parliamentary system is getting precedentialized. But on the other hand, uh, uh, the uh, parliamentary system is more suitable for India's uh, diversity. So I would say that, uh, I mean, I can't really see the presidential system as an alternative to it, notwithstanding the fact that the system is getting more and more uh, pre presidentialized and personality uh, focused. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. That's how it should be very uh, Rodranshu Singh. Good evening, ma'am. It was uh, good evening, ma'am. It was pleasure listening to you as always, as you were quite regular on TV screens when the UPA was in power. Uh, I would like to ask that, uh, in spite of all the formidable challenges that Indian democracy currently faces, the BJP had a bleeding nose in West Bengal and they have not been able to make inroads in Kerala. So is there any connection between the obsession for the right wing and the level of literacy? Because Kerala has the highest literacy rate in India and it, it does not carry a single BJP parliamentarian or a legislator in Kerala. Thank you. Sure, um, if we can... Uh establish a one-to-one -one relationship between literacy and opposition to uh, the right. But surely, surely uh, the social development of Kerala, the high rate of literacy uh, uh, and so on, and also uh, the lowest level of poverty, uh, high level of education, lowest level of poverty uh, and so on. It does, uh, I mean, obviously the Kerala model is a very, uh, is, stands in strong uh, contrast, let us say, to the UP model, uh, and uh, so so def so there is something to be said for uh, literacy and education contributing to progressive politics and to progressive policies. But on the other hand, uh, BJP was uh, rather resoundingly defeated in West Bengal where the level of literacy uh, or social development is certainly not uh, comparable to uh, Kerala, notwithstanding 30 year, 35 years of left rule in that state. So I think in India is, after all, I mean, whatever you find in one region can be contradicted by what is happening in, in another region. So it's, it's a country which defies generalization. Thank you, Professor. I am checking back whether Khalid Saab is available. Otherwise, I move forward to Imtia Saab. Last call, Khalid yes. Saab. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm... Hello? Yeah, go ahead. We, we hear you. Uh, thank you, Professor Zoya, ma'am. Uh, I have uh, two small questions. One is, uh, this, uh, this is the government or the society as a whole is changed? And, and if if it is the government, then it must be considered as a temporary phase. Uh, if it is government, if the, if the government is changed, then it must be considered as a temporary phase. It can be changed. That means India can go back to its earlier form of uh, secular democratic form of rule. And the second thing is that what kind of secular democratic rule we had since 1947 that India was ruled 
almost by a same party for almost for 60 65 years but the whole no narrative of this secular democratic democratic rule was collapsed within the seven year or five year so what kind of secular democratic country we had thank you thank you khalid sir well uh, i mean to your second question which if i understand right you're suggesting that if we did have uh, secular democracy for so long how and why did it uh, collapse so uh, quickly now that's a complex issue and and also i think uh, uh, while i'm certainly critical to the reshaping of democracy in india we cannot say that democracy has collapsed it is under stress and under threat uh, and there is uh, still as as we are discussing a great deal of um, of uh, resistance uh, and more importantly i think to your point about how and why uh, did things change so suddenly now that is a question that we need to think about and there are obviously uh, different ways of looking at it amrita suggested uh, an uh, uh, as one kind of argument as to why uh, modi was able to uh, why uh, why the bjp and prime minister narendra modi were able to establish popularity but there are uh, obviously other ways of looking at it and i would <clears throat> and i would not focus so much on the populist dimension or the uh, uh, or his personal popularity as much as i would on the institutional factors and political factors and organizational factors uh, that have contributed uh, to uh, the rise of uh, the right uh, in india okay thank you um tia saab and then qaisar naqvi saab and tia saab please thank you uh, thank you professor zoya hasan for your very insightful and scholarly presentation i have two questions and i will be brief the first question is as i see it there are three distinct model models of governance in our contemporary world one is the western democracies which luckily india opted for at the time of independence following independence the second is communist or the more successful version of communism which we see in china and the third is this kingdom saudi arab emirates etc as far as afghanistan taliban are concerned i do not know which way the, they would go hopefully democratic route so my question is because of significant success of china will not powers in india be tempted to be more authoritarian they will disregard the very fundamentals of democracy that is my they will think this is the way to go to be to develop to be big and the second question is which is kind of in looking inwards in the muslim community in india i know we muslims are under great uh, india sab india sab asked the question directly yeah, the please question we, is, we have a lot of people line yeah no no background please no right. background so, so my question is what can the muslims of india do in taking responsibility and developing their internal cohesion and integrity thank you <clears throat> so am i yeah uh, on the attractiveness of china as a model of uh, governance um well uh, and that, that uh, and that people would think of uh, going the authoritarian way i mean there is already an argument in india uh, about uh, uh, about a, a authoritarian methods of uh, governance and we are not looking to china i think it's it's already there uh, there uh, but it's a different kind of authoritarianism because obviously china and india are very different we have a very different uh, political system Uh, from the chinese uh, political uh, system so i don't think it's possible to go the chinese uh, way uh, in india uh, your second point about muslims and what uh, and whether muslims should focus on cohesion and integrity i think muslims would do well to focus on education 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 that's about it thank you 
Okay, thank you. Um, it was Kaiser Nafi Saab or it was Yamtia Saab? I'm sorry, I missed that. Kaiser Nafi Saab. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Zoya Hassan. Excellent presentation. Thank from my heart. Uh, the I must, first question, my question is, why India, uh, generally the public opinion in India, especially the politicians, are so have a Pakistan phobia or let me put it, a religious phobia so much. Why don't you get, get they get out of that cocoon, that mold and compete with the world as such? I mean, why Pakistan, why religion is, plays such important part in their uh, life? Okay, thank you, Kaisar Saab. And I, I should again remind that we have a lot many questions lined up and we covered only six people now and we had already 11 minutes gone. So please be brief. Please, please. Otherwise, please don't make me to interrupt you. Just ask pointed question. Thank you. Go ahead, ma'am. Well, uh, there is a Pakistan obsession, but I think that has increased uh, way, uh, after this government uh, came to power. Uh, and uh, of course, there is a history to it. It has to do with with the partition uh, of the country. And obviously, uh, there are very major political forces in India which are not reconciled uh, to the part partition because of their whole politics uh, and so on. So uh, certainly, and then of course, there is the Kashmir issue, which is still one of the uh, unsettled issues of our time. And as long as the Kashmir issue is not settled, Pakistan will always be on the horizon. But now I think Pakistan is not really a foreign policy issue as it was in the past. Pakistan has become kind of like an internal issue which is used for uh, uh, for domestic politics and for uh, for polarizing uh, politics. Thank you so much. And next person is uh, Sati Nath Chaudhary Saab and I'm going to read his question. What do you think about proportional representation system of elections. Do you think it can be helpful in getting us out of current malaise? I do think, I think that's a very important question uh, because the first past the post system that we adopted in India uh, at, at that time, I mean, when it was debated in the Constituent uh, Assembly, it was thought to be most uh, suitable for India. And perhaps at that moment, it may well have been uh, uh, appropriate. But given the way in which it has uh, functioned and the kind of uh, disproportionality that we have between vote share and seat share, there's no uh, no rela uh, relationship between them. Uh, I think it is, and also the fact that you can have a party which wins roughly 32% of the vote or 33%, which is just one third of the vote, and can win up to 280 seats or with 37% of the vote can win 300, uh, 303 seats. So there, and then there are other parties which win a significant proportion of the vote, but uh, their seat share is very limited. So there are very, there are anomalies in the first past the post system, which need to be, uh, which should be uh, addressed. And secondly, uh, proportional representation is in some ways a fairer system uh, because it does, give greater representation to underrepresented groups which are not concentrated in one part of the country. For example, the Sikhs, they're concentrated in Punjab. So they get a significant representation. In contrast, Muslims are spread all over India. And uh, well, other than Kashmir, they are sort of where there is a high uh, concentration. So a group which is, uh, uh, which is uh, as it were, distribute whose population is distributed across the country uh, stands uh, uh, would have problems of underrepresentation under the system. So there are certain structural uh, limitations of the first past the post system, but unfortunately, uh, this has not been discussed. It's just not on the table, even though, uh, as you may be aware, or many of uh, those present here would, would be aware, that proportional representation is the electoral system that is followed in most countries. Uh, and 
many, many countries are adopting some features of uh, the uh, for, um, proportional representation system in order to uh, in order to take care of the structural um, problems that the first past the post system presents. And so this is something that we that, that we need to discuss. And other than the left parties, uh, most other political parties are quite sort of satisfied with the existing system and have not really uh, encouraged any debate on this. So oh, thank you, thank you, ma'am. Uh, do you think that uh, some of uh, uh, Professor Basu's questions are covered, or you want to cover now? Because I'm afraid in the end uh, we may run out of time, unless uh, you are ready to be with us. Uh, and but Rafat what also, you and Rafat also, Professor Basu have to leave. I think she has another session. Somewhere. Yeah. So thank so you so much. Nice. That if you can compound all that in a very brief summary and then... all right, I yeah. will because there are still more people lined up. So please, uh, that's what I was thinking that we should cover Professor Basu's question now, rather than in the end. Okay, uh, I mean I think I'll just address some, because she uh, Amrita has raised some very very uh, important issues uh, which deserve. Uh, discussion and unfortunately we uh, uh, don't really have the time to uh, uh, to discuss and uh, discuss it in any detail but to the three central issues that she raised one is with regard uh, to her preference uh, to call this a populist uh, system rather than authoritarian uh, and to her point about uh, why is it that BJP was able to uh, win the elections in 2014 and, uh, and the grievances against the UPA and so on. And then the third very important question was, why is the political opposition uh, weak uh, in India and, and so on? Now, you know, I mean, this is, uh, there's perhaps a genuine uh, difference of opinion, I I do think that populism is an important concept, but I still uh, prefer to call this a right wing uh, authority. And this is a right wing politics. It's a right wing system, whether we want to call it authoritarian or populist. Uh, perhaps something is to be gained by uh, deploy deploying the term uh, populism, but. Uh, my, my own sense is that uh, I'm not uh, convinced that this government is, uh, as they claim, less corrupt and more democratic. It's certainly not more democratic. I think if after this 45 minute presentation, I have not been able to demonstrate that this government is not democratic, then I think, uh, well, what can I say? Um, uh, as to corruption, I mean, as far as I can see, I mean, look at the whole electoral bonds issue. What is this about? I mean, look at the corporate, uh, I mean, look at the corporate political nexus in India today. And this is largely because of, uh, well, not largely, but uh, it's, it has to do with their policies, but also electoral bonds. So, um, so therefore, yeah, it is true that uh, perhaps corruption at the highest level, uh, at the level of the uh, prime minister and so on, is not uh, uh, is not uh, is not there. But then, on, but then there wasn't. I mean, Prime Minister uh, Manmohan Singh was also not personally corrupt, but many of his ministers were uh, were uh, corrupt. Um, secondly, I think the point about uh, the 2014 elections and the grievances, of course, the grievances against the UK are, uh, are well known and have been, uh, and that is why, uh, that, uh, and those grievances were partly responsible for uh, their uh, defeat. And corruption was clearly the central issue, but I don't think it's, it was it was simply that there's uh, that there was so much evidence of uh, corruption but i think it is also the way in which this whole anti corruption movement was uh, was uh, was launched by uh, by the rss with the help of the india against corruption that 
that brought down basically that brought down uh, um, brought down uh, the government now the point about uh, dynastic politics and so on. Yes, of course, dynastic politics as an issue. But on the other hand, I mean, you can say, uh, I mean, and the Prime Minister spoke about it in his two uh, speeches, and his whole focus was that the biggest problem in India is dynasty. If that is so, then just about all political parties in India are uh, dynastic, with the exception of of uh, the BJP and the left parties, but the BJP rather warmly welcomes dynasts. Look at the number. I mean, they they I mean they lay out a red carpet for dynasts from other parties. So I'm uh, so, so now, of course, uh, my, the, uh, the prime minister rather cleverly changed uh, this argument by suggesting that that he's concerned about uh, dynasticism at the top. And not, uh, but you can have any number of political families in a party. That is okay, but not uh, not otherwise. And my point really is that I'm not convinced that India's democracy has suffered because of dynasticism. I do not think that is really uh, the central issue. The central issue are elsewhere. It has to do with politics. It has to do with money power. It has to do with the way political parties are organized, the way political parties uh, function. Those, uh, those are issues which are far more important than, uh, than uh, dynasty. Um, I'm not also uh, convinced that mo uh, that mo uh, the prime minister's popularity has to do with the fact that he has been able to distance himself from these issues. What does it mean to distance yourself from these issues when you allow all of what has happened to happen uh, and and no action is ever has been taken against any of these uh, any of these uh, excesses? Now, to the point about why political parties are weak in India, I think that is a very, very important issue um, that we need to debate, but unfortunately, we don't have the time. But I think it has something to do with our party system. It has to do with the fact that we have um, scores of parties. Uh, uh, it's not, I mean, so the Indian party system is so different from Britain or France or or the United States, of course, which has only uh, two parties, uh, whereas here, we have any number of parties and then of course you have a party system at the central level and a different one at the state level so it's far more complex and therefore more difficult uh, for for the opposition to unite because they're all concerned about their own political turf uh, and also uh, so that makes uh, opposition unity difficult but at the same time it's very clear that without opposition unity it's not really possible to take on a party such as uh, such as uh, the bjp and ultimately i do think that i don't uh, i mean in my understanding my uh, limited understanding we cannot really understand what is happening uh, and what the BJP has been able to uh, to do, achieve without looking at the relationship between the BJP and the RSS. The RSS provides the organization and the mobilization. Uh, and no other political party in India, for that matter, no right-wing party anywhere in the world has access to an organization such as the RSS, which has been working for a hundred years. Uh, and uh, and that is showing uh, that is showing results, and then I think uh, also uh, we we have to take into account that this government has not really delivered on just about most of its uh, uh, promises, and therefore, and yet, and yet uh, was re-elected in two thousand nineteen. Uh, uh, and uh, and so on. So I think the point then is that we have to take into account, as I said, this very unequal playing field, the kind of resources. I mean, which party has the kind of money that BJP has? Which party has the media at its command? Which party has an organization like the RSS at its, uh, at its command? So I think it is, we have to take into account I mean, while opposition parties ought to be doing much, much, much more, and they have been a very weak opposition, but but they're also in a somewhat uh, difficult uh, situation. And I do think that the media has played the most important 
part in the promotion and success of the political right in India. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. And uh, thank you, Professor Basu, if you have to leave early. And I hope uh, that your questions are um, answered. Uh, next is Anita Tagore and after that Hassan Ghaz. So I am going to read the question for Anita. What do you think will be the impact of the protest on the nature of the democracy given the unprecedented rise in operation of dissent? Sorry, I didn't. What is the impact of protest? Um, <laughs> I have to go back and look uh, the question. What do you think it? No, Anita, I'm so sorry. What do you Anita. think will be the impact of the protest on the nature of democracy, given the unprecedented rise in operation of distance? So she's asking what would be the impact yeah, of protest. I have actually responded to this uh, in the course of uh, the lecture Great. as well as this. I mean, these protests are significant, but obviously the scale and intensity has to increase for it to really make, uh, uh, make an important impact. Thank you. And um, Hassan Ghiyas Saab, and after that, I will read the question of Professor David Lelyveld. Go ahead. Um, Hassan Ghaz sahab, pointed question, please. Yes, Professor Zoya, uh, you mentioned yeah. uh, you mentioned public protests and growing resistance as bulwarks to the rise of authoritarianism. Uh, what are the other levers that can be used apart from the regional parties which you mentioned? Apart from protests. What are the other? Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, uh, I can. What are the other levers that can be used to counter the rise of authoritarianism and majoritarianism and the consequent decline in our democracy and in our polity, and which can form components of a cogent strategy to uh, counter what is happening in India today? Well, it's a, a very important uh, question. I'm not sure if I have uh, the answers to it. Uh, but I think one can um, look at it at two levels. One is, of course, international pressure. But that uh, is few and far between. Uh, and the pressure that counts is really American pressure. But, unfortunate, but American pressure is not... Uh, huge even under the uh, Democratic Party government, partly because India, because America looks upon India as a counterweight to China. So therefore, uh, the international pressure is is not uh, is not as strong as it could be. Although this government is quite bothered, is quite bothered about uh, you know about the adverse. Uh, adverse uh, uh, responses and reactions in in the Western world. So that's one aspect. Now, within the country, I think uh, it has to be. Uh, I do think that they have to be fought electorally, but that is not enough. And I think one of the problems with political uh, with the opposition parties in India is that they're focused only on the electoral domain and on, in the electoral domain, they need to unite, which they don't do. And therefore they're not even very effective in putting up an electoral opposition. But it is really uh, politics between elections that is, uh, that is uh, important. For example, in the United States, surely over the last four years before, uh, before the uh, elections a year ago, there was uh, a great deal of mm, criticism, opposition to uh, uh, Donald Trump. Now here too, it is there, but here the whole op uh, opposition gets dispersed and disunited and is therefore not effective. So I think it's the it is a ground level opposition between elections that needs to uh, be uh, strengthened. And 
obviously there's not enough of that, but a, a part of it is, has to do with the fact that for two years there was pandemic and there were restrictions on any kind of public and political activity. Um, so let's see, let's see if, uh, but then the farmers movement has given us uh, reasons to hope that it is possible to organize major large scale opposition. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So please, uh, uh, Tarek Bhai is the next, but please allow me to read uh, uh, Professor Lelivant's question. And uh, uh, so question is, uh, what is the role and relevance of US government and Indian diaspora support for the Modi Sarkar? And uh, after that, after Tarek Faruqi, Fazal Bhai, I see a lot of comments. If you are ready to ask the question, please let me know. Go ahead, uh, um, Professor Ma'am, to address uh, um, Professor Lally Welch's question. Yeah. Uh, well, I think I've already, uh, in a way, answered uh, that in, in response to the previous uh, question, which mm -hmm. is to say, uh, uh, well, there is, uh, you know, I mean, if you're looking at the, uh, the American government response, um, one might have expected stronger uh, reactions from, uh, from the Democratic administration than, let us say, the Republican administration, and given the proximity uh, of uh, our prime minister to President Donald Trump. Uh, now, perhaps there isn't that kind of... Uh, uh, close uh, relationship, and surely the defeat of Donald Trump would have been a setback for uh, for the present uh, for the government in India. But then, on the other hand, there is this whole China factor, and for, the U.S. is so preoccupied uh, with China and with the emergence of China as a <laughs> that uh, they are. Uh, I mean, they are looking upon India. As, uh, as I said, as a counterweight to China, and therefore uh, one cannot expect mm, that, uh, that the United States will give preference to democracy in India over countering China's economic uh, rise. Mm. So uh, now as to the diaspora, uh, well, I think the diaspora has, uh, has an important role, in it, but the diaspora in, in the United States is not a unified diaspora. There is, there are obviously sections of it which are uh, strong, strong uh, supporters of the pres uh, of the present regime. But there is also uh, uh, a diaspora, including I would like to thank this particular uh, uh, group and many others, and then so many other groups that have come up in the past uh, few years that are uh, that are very critical of this regime. And there is a fair, fair degree of criticism among intellectuals and academics in American uh, universities. And not only <clears throat> academics of Indian origin, but even, even others. So, uh, so the diaspora is important. And because, uh, and particularly because this government is very, uh, obviously, as we know, extremely uh, gives a great deal of importance uh, to the diaspora and the kind of support that they have received from them. <clears throat> Thank you. And, and there is a one like uh, Hindus for Human Rights uh, diaspora, which is also very critical. Okay. Uh, Tarek Bhai, please. And um, there are four more questions. And please oh. do not raise hands. And these will be the last four questions. Please go ahead. Tarek Bhai. Thank you very much, Zoya and the Indian diaspora for excellent presentation. I have a question based on unconfirmed reports, and I'm not sure if it is correct, that the West Bengal Legislative Assembly has been suspended as of today. Which Would assembly? You, West Bengal West Legislative Assembly has been suspended by the governor uh, as of today. It's dated 12th, February 2022. I'm not able to, you mean there's president's rule there? Uh, yes. I do not know what that is. That would mean President Azul. It says in exercise of the powers confirmed upon me by the subclause such and such, 
I, Jagdeep Dhankar, Governor of the State of West Bengal, hereby prorogue the West Bengal Legislative Assembly with effect from 12 February 2022. Uh, I do not know if this is true or fake, but uh, if it is true, what would be its but impact? How, but that's not, I don't think that's possible. It's not possible, so maybe it could be a fake. I don't yeah, everything is possible. If you uh, have any any more from a genuine newspaper or anything, yeah. that's fine. There are a couple of journalists, senior journalists sitting here. They could have immediately jumped upon it. So let's go. Let's not do that kind of uh, report. Yeah, I mean, this is something which is, we yeah. don't know. So what is the point of it? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Let's move on. Okay, next person is Fazal Bhai. You have so many comments. Is there any question embedded in there? He left. Okay, next person is uh, Muni Bashir. Uh, hello, ma'am. Hello. Yeah, please go ahead. Ma'am, my question is related to the related to the news, uh, Muslim in case of hijab. Are you hearing? Yeah, what is the question? Yes, sir, ma'am, we know the decision will either come in favor of Muslims or not. What would be the decision according to you? You mean decision of the court? I can't anticipate that. And I think one should not anticipate it. Ma'am, I am asking about uh, if the decision will come against the uh, Muslims or will come in favor of Muslims, will not be that. That's what I'm saying. How can we anticipate that? And it would be inappropriate and indiscreet to uh, to comment on that. I think so we have I to have, wait. For... I have posted if you. Okay. Thank you. Next person, please go ahead. Uh, so news is about the West Bengal. West Bengal Governor Jagdeep on Saturday prorogued the state assembly. Prorogation is discontinuing a session of parliament or a legislative assembly without dissolving it. So there is some uh, technical uh, legal things. No, no that uh, okay. does not mean uh, suspension. It doesn't mean suspension. Yeah. Yes, it doesn't. It's a prorogation. Okay, mm -hmm. next person is uh, Jafar Imam, and after that, uh, uh, Amir Bhai. So, Jafar Saab, please ask the question. I doubt that you will be still there. Let me see. Uh, Amir Bhai, be ready. Okay, Jafar Saab is gone. Uh, Amir Bhai, let me see. He's there. He is also gone. So, okay. So that uh, concludes. Uh, I, I hope I didn't miss anyone. And Chai Danwar Saab, uh, I think I covered you. Okay. So, so ma'am, uh, my simple question is because we hear so many things, uh, um, the critic uh, for BJP. And I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that you come in contact with the intellectuals who design these kind of uh, policies and you must have one-on-one -on -one discussion. So of course they are also smart because these are kind of uh, keep going for seven years. And uh, so what is their position? If you put something in front of them and they say, no, 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 it is constitutionally right. What you are saying is not true. So. I, I would love to hear the other side, what they say, because they must be thinking this, they are doing it right. That's what they keep doing. I right? have to, yeah, I yeah, know I understand your point, but I must confess, I'm not so fortunate as to be in contact with uh, policy makers in this government and they would not think it uh, necessary to uh, uh, to talk to people uh, like us who are uh, you know sort of critical of the government. So I'm not really in a position uh, to comment on uh, uh, from the inside 
uh, I have really no insight information, no insight uh, contact or uh, discussion uh, with uh, with uh, people in the present government. But of course, uh, like uh, everyone present here, I follow these issues and and there is uh, so so as I said, I can't really give you any uh, insight uh, insight. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so they're, they're, they're definitely an outsider, not an insider. I'm very much an outsider in the in the present scheme of things, and an insignificant outsider in the present scheme of things. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for staying with us uh, for more than two hours. And uh, Razi Bai will have a uh, last comment or whatever he wants to say. Go ahead, Razi Bai. Yeah, it was such a engaging session and it lasted more than two hours. So this must be very tiring. Yes. Most of the last 15 minutes, yeah. So in a few minutes, the only thing I can say that uh, there is there is a prescription that um, people and countries in struggle have taken or a group of people, which is like, uh, putting financial stress to, uh, you know, that is one thing that is a model for South Africa that we don't, we know very well, or Rhodesia. So perhaps India has not come to that stage where people will think, but certainly the diaspora groups must come up with more innovative ways and they should join forces with all those secular non-Muslims and Muslims, everyone, because there has been a big work here for a long time, which Hindutva forces did, and they have a very strong, um, a lot of diaspora is with them. But within few years, we have seen that all those muted groups have sprung up and they are putting forces together. As Rafat himself said, Hindus for Human Rights is very vocal. And we have a lot of academics and intellectuals in the US who are very much against that Hindutva ideology. So unless we make a real dent in that, we can't do much and we must come together and fight for not against Hindus or Hindu, anything rather than as a bad government, policies of a go bad government, which is creating problem for Indian democracy and its ethos. So that is the key that we must come up as a, as a good genuine patriots concern for India and Indian ethos, not against any particular party, not against any section of society. Uh, this should not be seen at all as Muslims, Hindus, or a certain class of Hindus against Hindus. No, it is against a bad government. And so pressure should be put financial or otherwise. These are the ways. Thank you very much. And we should be more vocal then. I do not know what will happen to our visa status later on, but we have to visit to India too. So anyway, it comes with the territory. So, uh, so be ready for post-election scenario for another, <laughs> another uh, nice lecture, you know. And hopefully this time that will happen. Sometime in March, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, in March. Thank you very much. I'd yeah. also like to extend my thanks to, uh, to the uh, Washington diaspora. This was a wonderful discussion. And thank you so much uh, right. for inviting me. It was very, very, yeah. very great pleasure and a great honor. Our, uh, yeah, it was, our it pleasure was more than honor. regular attendance. So, yeah. Very okay. nice. Okay. Thank Let's, you. Thank you so much. It was very nice hearing you, Zoma, Zoya, ma'am. Right. Second. Yeah, and this is quite engaging since I think within 10 days we had three. Uh, I mean, Fazan Mustafa's lecture. Then we had Irfan Habib Sahib's lecture. Next day, sometimes it has happened that we have to do this for on Gandhiji's and now yours. Now we are switching to our literary themes for two more uh, Saturdays, back again to a political theme. No, but I really want to congratulate both of you 
uh, Razir Din Saab and Rafat Hussain Saab. I mean, you're doing a great job. You're talking about the diaspora and the importance of expanding the critical uh, diaspora. And surely this group is, uh, is uh, contributing to uh, that effort in a major way. And thank you for this. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. You. So, ma'am, just to just to tell you that Professor Lally um, Weld is a very famous professor. Uh, right. David Lally Weld is a yeah. very Lally famous. Yeah, I know him very well. So, you know, David Lally. And it I was interesting. Him. It was very interesting that he attended your lecture. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, All right. So let's. Uh, bye bye. bye. Thank you. And. Thank you a lot. And this is quite great. My two grandchildren are waiting for me. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.